without further ado, I'm going to introduce my co-panelists today. So coming to us, uh, I believe, from Japan at the moment, we've got uh, Joshin and Shingo. Would you two introduce yourselves? Hi, guys. My name is Shingo Gokan. Uh, I'm founder of SG Group. Now we are at SG Club in Tokyo. And this is Joshin, brand manager of SG Shochu. Hi, guys. We're here downstairs at the SG Club at SIP. Um, this is where we do our cocktail pairing experience, which we're going to tell you about in a little bit. So we're excited to be here. Great. And then also joining us today is Sun. Will you introduce yourself? Let us know where you are joining us from and a little bit about yourself. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Sun. Uh, I work in uh, penicillin in Hong Kong. So today I'm in my bar here. Uh, yeah, there we go. Great. And uh, joining us, we, as we said, we've been having a little bit of technical di difficulty. We have Devander, who uh, I don't know if you can jump in for a second and introduce yourself as well. Can any, everyone hear me now? Yep, we can hear you now. All right, fantastic. Sorry, everyone, that uh, it took me a little bit of time to come on. But yes, my name is Devander. I'm from um, Hong Kong, been here about seven years now, and uh, recently moved to a new project that uh, we're working on that again, very associated with the Japan and uh, what we will be talking about. So Ju, Meishu, uh, Sake and uh, Awamari. So it's in the Mandarin Oriental that I'm working at. We are opening a new bar on the top floor that is uh, driven by Izakaya uh, concept. And uh, yeah, so we are here and now we'll be talking about, this is not the bar uh, uh, I'm working at because uh, the bar is still under a little bit of uh, touch up the final touch up that we are doing it. And this is a bar that has been open. No, the bar that I'm at has been open since 1963, uh, since basically the hotel uh, uh, opened. And uh, yeah, it's very classic bar, serving a lot of draft beer, beers in general, and uh, some of the whiskeys collection that they have. Great. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, lovely. So just as a quick introduction, I just want to first introduce the idea and then quickly reassure everyone not to worry about this too much. This idea of the food pairing. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm not saying you shouldn't try it, but it isn't really the most important thing. Food is delicious, you should eat food. Cocktails are delicious, you should drink cocktails. But most of us don't really need to worry too much about what is the perfect pairing. And I think that when you look at other beverage categories, for, a, for many people, they're always thinking about, you know, what is the perfect wine pairing? What is the perfect thing that goes with this dish? What's the perfect beer pairing? And there's a lot of mostly people trying to advertise, people trying to sell you something saying that this is the right and only way to do this thing together or the best way to do this thing together. I say, let that go. It's not that important. The bottom line is, and especially when it comes with shochu, it is something that just goes with food. Um, there, I have yet to have a food that doesn't work with shochu. And this isn't like a, you know, it's the best spirit because it works with everything. It's just a simple fact that it kind of works with everything. In the same way that almost every other spirit category also works with almost everything. If you go to a fine dining restaurant, whether it's a very fancy sushi place or a very fancy Italian place in Japan, you can pair shochu with that. It's going to work. There's no reason that it's not going to work. In fact, one of the best ways that I had shochu completely unexpected was at the end of a meal where we had done a, um, a, a meal of like a broth, where with the leftover broth in a bowl, we just poured a little bit of shochu over it and then we added it and had it almost in the same way that you have hot water in shochu, but with the broth. Completely unexpected, not traditional in any sense, but something that was delicious and something worth trying. Think that shochu is something that can work with any category of food and just experiment because it's a lot of fun to try different things. So with that said, uh, let's go to our first two presenters, panelists, experts, really the people who know the most about shochu and food pairings, uh, Shingo and Joshin. Let us know what you guys have to show us today. All right. Um... I agree, Don. Uh, I love the uh, shochu with that. So it's like a Japanese bull shot. So but anyway, so today we're going to uh, introduce uh, our food pairing. So here uh, downstairs, SG Club, uh, SIP. Before pandemic, we uh, used to run as a regular cocktail bar, which means like 
it's small space, like a lot of people packed here. But uh, since um, last June, we switched to the, um, changed to the, uh, the different uh, style. Uh, now we call SG Airways. Um, it's like a cocktail pairing restaurant. We offer um, eight courses of uh, cocktail and food, and we pair with the uh, music as well. Eight courses, the business class, and 11 courses, first class. We do the two, uh, two sittings every day. Uh, so now, we, uh, today, we're going to um, uh, show you um, our three courses of, uh, from uh, SG Airways. All right, so um, like Shingo just said, um, the three courses we're gonna be sharing today are gonna be from the SG Airways cocktail pairing experience. And basically the idea, we call this Airways because each course is designed to take you to a different destination in the world. So right now, obviously travel is not the thing everyone is doing. Um, and so we're taking this opportunity to actually uh, so what Shingo showed you, it's a little bit far away, but these are, this is the actual menu of the cocktail pairing. Each course is designed as a flight ticket. So with each course, the guest will receive a new ticket, which I'll just read out loud what says here, what it says here. Um, this first course that Shingo is going to be making in a minute is Phuket. So um, we have a dish and a cocktail and then music representing that course. So all of the cocktails that are part of the SG Airways um, experience is based off of the SG Shochu. And the SG Shochu is a Honkaku Shochu that we actually developed in uh, collaboration with three of some of the most well-known uh, Honkaku Shochu makers in Japan. Um, so I'll just give you a very quick introduction. Uh, so we have kome, imo, and mugi, which are the Japanese words for rice, sweet potato, and barley. And the kome, uh, we work with Takahashi Shuzo, who is best known for uh, hakutake shiro. So they're in Kumamoto uh, rice shochu. And we have imo in the middle here, which is a sweet potato shochu. Uh, we work with Satsuma Shuzo to make this. They're in the very southern tip of uh, Kagoshima, uh, also a, a town that they make some of the best katsuobushi in uh, bonito flakes in Japan. So this is a purple sweet potato shochu. And then the mugi, we work with sanwashiri in uh, Oita prefecture um, to make a kind of a light barrel age style of mugi shochu. So like Don said, uh, shochu does go well in general with food. The way I think about it is that it prepares your palate to enjoy flavors further. So it's not just inherently that the flavors match the flavors of the dishes, but I find that it kind of conditions your palate to um, enjoy dishes more deliciously. But then we took this uh, Honkak Shochu, which already works quite well with food, and really tuned it in a way that um, it makes it extremely versatile for cocktail making. So that, that has to do with um, ABV. A lot of Shochu is bottle that low uh, ABV, which is um, a lot of bartenders are not, you know, super familiar working with 25% alcohol uh, based spirits. So we're bottling these at around 38 to 40 and then kind of balancing the intensity of the koji flavor as well as the um, kind of uh, the flavors that you get from the distillation. So like kind of the cooked notes and whatnot. So balancing all those, so you get a very good representation of the base ingredient. You have a strong foundation of flavor from a single distillation, um, but at the same time working well with cocktails and having a nice finish uh, balancing out with the other ingredients. So um, that's a quick intro right here. And then uh, we're gonna go into making uh, some of these drinks today. All right. Uh... Let me start from uh, uh, Phuket, uh, Kome Shochu cocktail. I found out that Kome goes well with the um, uh, cold dishes, and Imo goes well with the sweet dishes, and Mugi goes well with the um, warm dishes. Uh, so the first dishes, uh, first destination is uh, Phuket, Thailand. Let me show the cocktail ingredients right here. All right, so um, this cocktail is inspired by Phuket, Thailand. Uh, so the coconut is most uh, well-known ingredient in Thailand. So we make the coconut oil fat washed uh, actually shochu kome, 
and coconut water and doburoku, which is the unfiltered sake. It's very traditional unfiltered sake. Uh, you can actually have a texture of the rice as well and very funky notes, you know, a little bit of acidity and sweetness as well. And cilantro syrup. This is a very simple uh, making syrup. We, we just basically uh, make a two to one simple syrup infused uh, cilantro. That, that's it. And you get a beautiful color to it. So all our cocktail, uh, we batched in the one bottle. Because of that, uh, we have to do that, you know, uh, some fat wash and oil wash and, you know, clarification and, you know, filtration. So we have a lot of process. So we basically make a, you know, pre batch Then we can make a cocktail, you know, within like one minute or two minutes or so. And each cocktail, we make a lower ABB uh, because of the food bearing is, if it's too high, it kills the flavor. So most of the cocktail we make uh, below 12%, oh, below 15%. It's like a wine or, you know, like sake ABB. And also amount of the drink is not so, uh, not too much as well. Uh, each drink is about, I would say uh, this drink, it, is 30 ml. Um, so I would say uh, at most two ounces maximum. And also temperature wise, uh, we don't make uh, too cold when we do the cocktail pairing uh, because most of the food is uh, not too cold, even if it's cold, cold food. So we make uh, less than 10 degrees Celsius. There we go. So this is uh, the drink inspired by Phuket. So we paired with this food called Kaoyam, uh, which is a Southern uh, local Thai food. Uh, in the middle, uh, we have uh, butterfly pea steamed rice, so blue rice in the middle, and uh, Japanese macro on top, and a bunch of different herbs from Thailand, and sauce is uh, shrimp and nampla sauce. The main flavor is shrimp and herbs. So that's why we pair with the coconut. Coconut and shrimp it goes well. And yeah, obviously, uh, you know, cilantro is herbs. So it goes with the, you know, other herbs in the, on the plate. You know, the, the shochu has a uh, koji and koji is the, uh, the best ingredients to make a, a pairing. So, you know, you can't really make a gin cocktail pairing from appetizer to the uh, dessert, but shochu it's e easier to create the, you know, coarse pairing from the appetizer to dessert because it's a koji, you know. And yeah, this is Phuket. And let's um, go to the next destination. Um, Spain, Jerez de la Frontera. Jerez de la Frontera is the south of Spain in the Andalusia st states. And they're known for sherry. Um, you know, Jerez in English is sherry. Sherry, sherry in, in Spanish is Jerez. So it's the, you know, like sherry town. So the cocktail is, like I said, you know, warm hood is, uh, goes with the mugi. So I picked the mugi, barley shochu. And this is umeshu. Uh, umeshu is plum wine in English. So plum wine, it has like a lot of different variation, but we use a hoshiko. Uh, you know, Japan, you get a million of umeshu. So we picked a hoshiko. This has a little bit of spice in it. Um, it's, go it's easier to make a cocktail. And orange, uh, we, we, we make a clarified orange juice um, and katsu, you see? Katsu is a bonito flake. Um, that's uh, you know, one of the most uh, important ingredients for Japanese food. Uh, we use this for the cocktail. How we make this cocktail, it's pretty simple. So basically we uh, put the mugi and clarified orange juice, umeshu and strain with the katsuobushi as a filter. Then uh, it's like a cold brew coffee through the, all the drinks uh, goes to, uh, uh, through the filter of katsuobushi then you get a flavor of katsuobushi. So it's like a, like a lot of umami and you know, smokiness uh, into a drink. So yeah, this is uh, what we have. And this is called Venencia. Uh, it's a traditional uh, tool uh, pouring for the sherry, it's a long stick, like spoon. 
the why the reason why they you know they use this because sherry bar is huge so you have to have a long stick to scoop the sherry and when you pour they do the aeration then you get a um, you know the flavor is opens up There we go. Um, let me see the color. Uh, it's basically the color is comes comes from a uh, um, uh, katsuobushi. It's like a you know first brew of katsuobushi, so it's very clean. Uh, there's tons of umami and uh, the smokiness to it, and a little bit of fruitiness from the umeshu and orange. And the food that we pair with is uh, it's a little bit of tricky food. Um, on the bottom, it's nori, like seaweed paper. Seaweed, seaweed paper, no, seaweed, seaweed, seaweed sheet, and uh, rice cake, mochi on top. Wrap it up with the hamon iberico. Uh, it's old hamon iberico, uh, you know, Spanish prosciutto, you know, right? And on the top, natto butter. So we basically we, we blend with the butter and natto, so you just get a flavor of natto. And top is scallion, and basically you know wrap it up and then eat by the hand. So this is how, how we pair it. The reason why we use this, we, we make this food, uh, because of umami is a key uh, element of uh, this pairing. Um, you know, natto has umami and nori has umami because it's made from uh, seaweed and um, hamon that's also has, you know, you know, big umami. And also we actually uh, put the two types of sherry, I forgot to mention, uh, ororoso sherry and fino sherry. Um, ororoso sherry is, goes away with the fat, uh, you know, especially hamon's fat. And fino is goes well with the uh, red, red part of uh, meat. So that's why we blend the uh, two, two sherry. Yeah, so this is it. And Joshin's gonna explain the uh, uh, third destination with the uh, Shishochu Imo. All right. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the third course that we're gonna um, show you today. And we actually chose three of the courses that require the fewest ingredients to make out of our uh, out of the SG Airways experience. And one of the one of the things that is really unique about cocktail pairings, as opposed to wine uh, pairings or uh, something like that, is that you can actually create something to match something instead of just selecting something that goes with something. So when when we're coming up with uh, dishes, uh, especially with shingo between the chef they're constantly tasting between the dish and the cocktail and adding and subtract, subtracting ingredients and also uh, balancing each other out. So, so with a lot of these cocktails, um, we batch not only for speed, but because uh, some of these require more than 10 ingredients. And when you, when you look at the recipe of one cocktail that we serve, a certain ingredient, we might only have like one ml of that ingredient inside and so that's pretty difficult to make consistently uh, when you have like two or three ingredients that's like one drop one ml two ml you know 6.5 grams stuff like that so um, in this case it is much easier to use uh, big batches so we can you know use ingredients like concentrated ingredients say we're using soy sauce and we can actually measure five grams instead of trying to measure 0 0.5 grams for one drink um, but anyway, the last drink that we're going to show you today is inspired by Antwerp, Belgium. And um, the idea we have going on here is like beer, uh, white chocolate, that sort of pairing. So um, <clears throat> for the cocktail, we start with the Eschi Shochu Imo. So like I said, sweet potato, uh, purple sweet potato shochu from Kagoshima, from Satsuma Shuzo. It's a black koji. We forgot to say what kind of koji these are. The eshi shochu kome and the mugi are based on white koji. Um, and then the imo is based on a black koji. Uh, and this is atmospheric pressure distillation. So we have this as the base. We actually wash this with coconut water, uh, with a cacao butter to start with. Um, and that serves as a base. And then we, we want to go for like this kind of white chocolate and corn uh, thing for the cocktail. So we make a corn milk punch. And 
Um, the way we do that is we basically cook the corn with the husk, with the kernels, and we shave off the uh, kernels, blend it up, and then we actually add a little bit of pineapple juice for the acidity, milk, and then we strain that to make a non-alcohol corn milk punch. And as we're straining, we actually put um, dehydrated corn powder into the filter, again, to sort of intensify the corn flavor. So that's what we have here. We're gonna use a little bit of a cacao liqueur as well. And then, um, and then so that's what we have for the drink. So yeah, we're, we're mostly serving 30 ml portions of uh, cocktails especially when you're, when you're having 11 course um, dinners. And if you have uh, too many cocktails, you're not gonna, you're not gonna walk out of the building uh, looking normal. So uh, we wanna keep it reasonable. All right, so this is what we have for the drink. And then um, for the dish that we're pairing it with, um, so the idea here is that the drink is chocolate and corn, and then the dish is gonna be uh, representing basically like a Belgian beer. So we, we go for a, a, a whole garden reduction and it's top, it's basically uh, with a, sorry, with a grapefruit granny tape a whole garden reduction. And then we're doing a panna cotta with some spices to represent speculos, which is a Belgian sort of biscuit. And so each of these elements are kind of working together. Beer and the corn really go well together. Uh, grapefruit and the pineapple uh, have a nice sort of match with the acidity. And the sweet potato and the spices like cinnamon and uh, cloves that we use for the panna cotta, that goes really well together as well. Um, and especially, we don't do this so much in Japan, but in the States, uh, like for Thanksgiving meals and stuff, um, you have a lot of sweet potato uh, baked with marshmallows and spices and stuff like that. And that's oh, that sort of... <laughs> All right, so those are the three drinks that we're going to be showing you today. Um, Don, are we good? I've, I've muted them. Keep going. Okay, okay. So yeah, that's about what we have. Um, uh, right now. So these are the three drinks. And then actually this month, February is going to be the last month that we're going to be serving this SG Airways course. Um, and uh, well, if we have a little bit of time, we'll tell you about it later, but we have another project coming up uh, just about tomorrow. So uh, maybe towards the end, we'll tell you a little bit about that as well. Great. So um so many things I want to ask you about. Uh, I almost regret letting you do all three cocktails in a row because each one I have so many questions. But so overall, as the group and as this uh, this this tasting menu, this pairing menu. Um, so what came first? You know, the destination, the cocktail, the food. Did it all come together at the same time? Like how how did the like kind of what's the order of in which things came together? Well, uh, most of the um, course, uh, we create the food first, then uh, make the cocktail. Then uh, we can adjust a little bit about a little bit of drink and food both as well, you know, add a sauce and maybe, you know, take the sweetness out. So, but basically we, we create the food first. Cool. And then, but I always so give the chef idea. Uh, so it's completely different from a wine pairing. Sommelier basically, uh, you know, pair wine uh, with the food and they, they don't say nothing to the chef. That's the kind of rule. But, you know, we are cocktail pairing and, and, you know, I basically ask chef to create the food, you know, like this kind of food, cow yam and put the, you know, cilantro, you know, whatever. Then uh, I make the cocktail. Then I ask chef to, you know, put more ingredients or, you know, take more ingredients. So, you know, we can adjust. That's the... Um, um the great thing about the cocktail pairing right no that's it's th something that was that joshin mentioned that you know most people like when you think about pairings it's like i have this thing that i can't change and you know i'm going to pair it to a food 
Whereas with cocktails, you can adjust it in, in a thousand different ways to make it the exact right pairing. It's something that, you know, we as bartenders, we can do that so many people don't get to do if you're, as you said, just a sommelier and working with wine, that especially in the more expensive the wine, you know, oh, we got, can't, can't mess up this perfect wine, right? Whereas we're like, oh no, this is a delicious uh, shochu. I'm going to make it better. I'm going to make it into, into something new and different. So the, exactly. the ingredients you guys are working with here, you know, so you're, you've got so many steps that happen before the guests get there. Uh, if I could talk to you a little bit about some of your sub ingredients. So the, um, the, for the first Thai drink, you did a, a cilantro syrup, right? So yep. did you blanch the cilantro first? Did you, is it blended? Is it pureed? How did you get that bright color? Well, we just a uh, simple infusion, uh, you know, make a simple syrup and then I put a bunch of uh, cilantro and just uh, just leave, then strain and you get a, at, a beautiful At regular color. room temperature. And so yep. you didn't even heat it up. Wow. Nope. That, that's pretty amazing to get that great color. I out think uh, uh, the key is uh, you, you need to put a lot of cilantro and then uh, don't leave, don't uh, leave too, too long. Just, you know, one or two days and then just take it out. And then you get okay. a bit are, of are you muddling it as well or just putting mm, it in no holes? it's just simple soaked wow that's pretty amazing it's such a beautiful color uh i'm sad that you know you you're basically almost done with this pairing it means that there's no way i'm gonna get to try it because you know with the lockdown no one's going anywhere so i'm sad that i don't get to, tr to, to try these drinks uh and then so the, the next uh the drink you know inspired by uh the south of spain um i mean Southern Spain, you know, we, that's another place that where it's so full of umami. Sherry is full of umami, you know, like uh, the Iberico uh, ham is like, it's so full of umami, the, all the seafood down there. And so you've got all those things happening, not only in the dish, but also in that cocktail. And, you know, it, it's something that I think a lot of people who've never worked with shochu don't know too much about is that level of umami you get in the spirit from the koji. So could you tell us a little bit about, you know, just how you think about the the koji in the in shochu and, and you know you mentioned that you know you have two white koji you have one black koji for people who've never experienced the difference between the two what is the difference and you know and how do you think about those two when you're making a cocktail all right joshin's going to explain about the um koji because he's the brand manager of osg shochu um okay so like i said don earlier um I think that, of course, from the koji-based fermentation, you have the different uh, sort of acids that come out. Um, you're also having like some breakdowns of the proteins from the enzymes and stuff like that. So you're unlocking a lot of amino acids, making uh, more flavors available to your palate. And so I, I guess like it's a characteristic of um, not just shochu, but also like miso, soy sauce, meeting, sake, like everything that uses koji. It, the, the, the way that I, I really like to think about it is that it really primes things to be enjoyed more flavorfully. So it's not so much, in my opinion, that the koji itself, if you just extract the flavor of koji, oh, like it's so delicious and so strong with umami flavor. I don't really think of it like that. I think of things that are, it's kind of like salt, like nobody eats salt on its own because it's delicious. It, it really unlocks a lot of the flavors that it goes with. And that's kind of how I think about koji as well, that it really unlocks a lot of the flavors of the things that it's paired with. So in these cases, um, we're using SG, like we're using the SG shochu as a base, but what, you know, typically when you think about like a base spirit, like say a, a, a da, like daiquiri or like, you know, a, any sort of classic cocktail, you're gonna have, the base spirit is gonna serve a pretty, you know, you're gonna have at least an ounce or 45 ml or 60 ml of the base spirit. And that's gonna be the foundation. But in a lot of these cocktails, the, the sort of non-spirit ingredients serve the foundation of uh, a very important foundation of the flavor. And then the koji aspect is really kind of enhancing those other flavors as well. So there'll be certain cocktails on our menu, not, not, not necessarily these three that we showed you today, but even on our menu that we, like, of course we created the SG Shoju and we love it and we want to tell everyone about it, but there are certain drinks that we don't even mention that we use the SG Shoju because we use such a small amount of it, because, almost as bitters, because it kind of brings out other flavors even without mentioning 
that, that we're using shochu. So that's kind of the interesting aspect about koji, in my opinion. Yeah, it's uh, definitely the parallels you're making about that salt is, that, is the perfect analogy. You know, when we add salt to, to food, it's not so that we taste the salt, it's so that we taste everything else, right? And so, you know, we got, we have that, as you said, the aminos coming from the, the koji, but you also have that, you know, you guys are getting it from the bonito, you guys are getting it in the form of uh, nori in your food, uh, you know, from the breakdown of, uh, of hamon, there's so many layers of that, of that umami and savory flavors going on. It's, it's, it's very cool. Um, I, one of the things that I've been playing with is using koji as a way of, of creating new ingredients for cocktails. And uh, you, when you guys said that you were working with corn in that last uh, drink, one of the problems that a lot of people have when they're first playing with corn is that, especially raw corn, is that it becomes cloudy and kind of chalky. And it's because of the starch that's in corn. And one of the magic things about koji is that it turns starch into sugar. So if you were to take raw corn and blend it with a little bit of uh, koji, it might actually make it so that you can get a, uh, a, a, a product at the end of it where you can remove that, uh, that cloudiness and that starchiness. Um, it's something that I've been playing with just in the very simple uh, making uh, things with rice. So when you might wanna make like a rice syrup, if you were to use just plain rice, you would be chalky. But if you, you know, if you add the koji to the rice, it breaks down all those starches, and then you get a rice syrup, like an amazake syrup. But it's not chalky in the same way. So it's very cool. And, uh, and now that you guys have been working with corn, I'm like, ah, oh, I gotta, I gotta go play with some corn and uh, and koji now. But that last drink, it's almost different from everything else you've done so far, though in that it's it's more in this like sweet direction whereas everything else was kind of like very savory and then you know i get belgium chocolate when you're working with things that are kind of more in that like dessert like realm and flavors you know is there something that you're thinking about specifically when you work with a shochu and more sweeter style drinks like do you do you use shochu in like tiki drinks where we naturally think of oh tiki drinks are like a sweeter style of drink it's very easy to be like oh a martini savory drink, I can use shochu, but maybe for people who've never really worked with shochu, they might find it harder to think about it as in a sweeter kind of drink. How do you guys use shochu in like a tiki kind of application? Well, it's actually easier for me because uh, emo has a kind of like a tequila and, you know, rum, like kind of tropical notes. So, and yeah, when I make like a tiki twist or whatever, like a tropical twist, I, I'll choose the emo always. And uh, interesting about shochu, the kome, when I use this, uh, uh, you know, when I make a classic cocktail twist, uh, kome used as a gin or vodka. Uh, imo, like I said, uh, we use as a uh, rum or tequila. Uh, mugi, we use as a whiskey. Then, you know, we can, you know, make easy classic twist drink. Um, yeah. So sweet drink, and also mugi, our SU shochu mugi has a cacao and a vanilla note. So uh, that's also uh, easier to make, um, you know, blended brandy twist drink uh, as well. Right, and, and the words you're using, just for people who aren't familiar, we're talking about the base ingredient that the shochu is made from, because shochu can be made from so many different things. So when you say emo, you're, what you're talking about is the Japanese purple skin sweet potato. And there's many kinds of Japanese sweet potatoes for many different kinds of shochus, but specifically you're talking about the, the purple on the outside, you know, uh, more yellow, not the American, orange sweet potato that's when you what you see what you mean right yeah well so in in our case the the sweet potato for this emo is actually a purple sweet potato um but emo oh, is actually on the a inside generic, as well yeah purple on the inside as well so that's not typical for a sweet potato shochu of course and that has a lot of the more sort of nectary notes um and um what they call like more yogurty kind of uh, aromas as well um, um, and, but sorry, Don, I just wanted to also add that um, right, right now we're talking about shochu kind of generically and the koji and like the characteristics that shochu have in general. But I think the important thing to uh, recognize, like as soon as you actually start playing with shochu is that each uh, variety is so different. And the, the people who are making it the way I think about it is kind of like they're like jazz musicians or like studio musicians that they can like pretty much guide the fermentation and the, and the distillation to a point like exactly what they're looking for. It's like the sort of 
extreme expertise of Japanese fermentation. So when, when we talk about like say matching uh, shochu with sweet things, there's definitely certain shochus that are much easier to work with sweeter things. So for example, like vanillin that comes out of um, barrel for like, you know, barrel aging and some of that oxidizing, you have certain chemical compounds that turn into vanillin. These shochu makers, like say like for the Mugi, for example, um, it is a barrel aged shochu that does have a, a decent um, kind of vanilla note, but they're actually choosing types of koji types of yeast that will make predecessor compounds uh, that will turn into vanillin more readily when aged in a barrel. So certain people will not, will choose not to do that. You know, they don't want so much of that uh, sort of oaky vanilla notes in, in their barrel aged shochu, or they might not want so much nectary kind of notes in their sweet potato shochu and they can control that in every step of the way. So I think the important thing to realize is um, with whatever you're trying to do for a cocktail to choose shochu that kind of cater to that. And also if you have a certain shochu, really taste it and kind of let that guide you as opposed to just like trying to make the logic force your way into making it work. Definitely. Wise words. Um, yeah, it, I think for those of you, especially in, the, in America, it, if you want to find a, another analog in another spirits category, it's kind of like mezcal. You know, for the average person who doesn't know anything, you're just like, oh, it's just a smoke bomb. But every kind of mezcal is wildly different. And to think about it as one giant category is actually does the entire category a disservice. And so, yes, when we talk about shochu, we talk about it generally, but yeah, every single variety the kind of, uh, you know, the, the koji and also the specific thing that the distiller is trying to do, whether it's uh, reduced pressure distillation, you know, at, at full atmospheric pressure, you can make so many different things. It is such an interesting category and it, everything is wildly different yet unified in the sense that it does have this, this common koji characteristic. So such, such a cool category and so much fun to, to play around in as a bartender. So um, I'm going to move over to Devender. Unfortunately, I believe he has a meeting he needs to get to next. Is there anything you two want to add before we move on? And we'll, we'll come back to answer some questions if people want to throw questions in the, in the chat for us at the end of this. Um, we're good for now. I think we took up enough time to start with. Thank you so much. All right, great. So Devender, do you want to uh, tell us about your cocktail and, and show us what you're making with shochu? Yes. Um... So um, I have a drink that um, that we will be making here because as I mean it's it, it's it's almost like a destiny. Like last time uh, when we were all in Japan and experiencing soju and uh, sake around Japan, it was it was really great that it was a eye opening and for the very very first time that I mean I experienced uh, soju. Um, it's something that. From Japan, I only knew sake that exists, and but awamori and soju is something that never came to my mind until um, uh, we were invited uh, in Japan for that. And now we are opening an establishment here, which will again focus on many other elements of Japan, but also uh, in terms of the cocktail, we will be uh, focusing on soju, awamori, <clears throat> and umeshu. So we have a drink that uh, that we have worked on, and something that in Japan, people drink a lot, but outside of Japan, not very much familiar. So we are looking at the category of uh, uh, Chuhai. And that's something that has been uh, drank in Izagaya, you know, all around Japan, but not outside of it. And for Hong Kong as well, it's something very, very new. Um, something that is not, like, not, not been focused on. Even in a Japanese restaurant, you look at more sake that has been, uh, uh, drunk and uh, than anything else so we have a drink it's called what we call a banana and champagne it's uh and again we are looking at the too high style of the drink so let me get on on that so again the i can keep it here yeah so we are looking at uh, again when we were looking at the uh, too high we were looking at like okay what style so we have around four different too highs and this is my event that we are working on. So it's a Fernie Hunter, 
uh, to give a little bit of dryness to it that we're using rather than using a fernet branca, for example, because it can be very, very intense. And since all the ingredients are clear in this, if you add fernet branca, it kind of makes the drink a little bit colorful, which we don't want. We want to make it as transparent as possible. A little bit of fernet hunter and the banana liqueur. I mean, it was very weird when we came with the idea of like, we are doing a banana and champagne. And we were like, maybe people are not gonna like it because people like either banana separate or champagne separate, but not all together. But then as we were working on it, it just came together really well. And we were like, okay, why not we give it a try and let people try something new. So we have about 15 ml or half ounce of uh, banana. And it might sound, like it's very overly sweet, but no, the Fernet Hunter actually gives the dryness that takes away that sweetness from uh, from the banana. And then we have a two different uh, uh, two different uh, soju we are working on here. So here we have um, Sumi 25, and here we have a sweet potato soju. So we, because I think the Sumi 25 is a rice uh, based on rice soju. We're gonna add 15 ml of it. It's gonna give a more length to it where the more structure and body is gonna come from the, the potato soju. About one ounce of it. And to finish it off, we have a champagne that we're gonna add about about three ounces. Can I add a little bit of... And again, when we were looking at uh, the pairing, I thought, what, what should be the garnish of this? And we wanted people to try or have a small bite uh, because since it's a very low ABV drink, we are like, why don't we give it something that has a flavor to it and something that kind of matches really well with the banana. Then we came up with this ingredient that is quite fascinating to us. It's called ume, but then the, yeah. So I don't know if you can, so here it's called uh, ume that the Japanese chef actually Introduce us, uh, introduce this to us, and it tastes like um, almond. So here are some flowers that you can actually bite on, and it literally it's almost like a, uh, you're eating an almond. And we thought like, okay, banana and almond goes really well. Why not we put this one on top so people can try, people can enjoy, and and goes really really well with the um, with the, with the whole drink altogether. So yes, so this is our uh, Chuhai, and this is the only drink that. At the moment, I have that I will be presenting to you. Um, it's called banana and champagne. Great. Uh, so, a couple questions for the folks who've never heard of a chuhai before. How would you explain that to to people who've never been to Japan? The chuhai, I mean, essentially, is chuhai is a highball that is more driven on the aerated beverage. So you have some sort of sparkle to it, whether it's a soda or you can make a fruit flavored soda like green apple or apple or any any sort of thing and then you must have a fruit element to it so it could be uh, even citrus you can look at like lime lemon or grapefruit melon what what chua essentially is based on soju as compared to whiskey when you're looking at the highball type and uh, it should have a little bit of fruit element to it and top it up with something sparkling that is what the chua yeah and in your mind, when you think about that, is that very different from, you know, just highballs in general, or is it just one, you know, subset of the family of highballs? And is it also completely different from, let's say, like a spritz, or is it similar to a spritz, but just the, the base spirit is the difference? You know, how does it fit in the world of other cocktails? I think it is something very similar to the highball, I would say, but I will not, I will I will always introduce Chuhai as one of its own uh, category of uh, drinks rather than um, rather than this subcategory, I would say. But it's it, because Chuhai is something that not many people heard of. So I think we need an element where 
we compare that to something else. So that's when the highball as a term comes into the place. But then I would like, if I'm serving this to a guest, I will always specifically say that it's a chuhai and explain them what the chuhai is and what style of it and where it came from. And over, uh, let's say the, the, the spritz, for example, and spritz can be in many other terms. And it's generally, when you're looking at the spritz, it's very similar style, but has it like, I don't know how to differentiate as such, but then in terms of the, the Chuhai style, I would, I would always be very specific and it's a different category that has not been heard of. And for your menu, for this new bar you're opening, is that gonna be its own category, like its own section of the menu and you're gonna have yes. a, a selection of Chuhai? Very yes, cool. we will, because we are looking at the, um, I mean, again, different element of it. And, 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 and as I said before that, when you, when you go to a Japanese bar as well, Japanese bar, they focus a lot on um, the, the whiskeys that they have and uh, the highballs, and that is something very great. But you know, and we, in, 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 at least in Hong Kong, we miss out on something like uh, soju-driven drinks, which again, I'm very, very glad that I have an opportunity to kind of work on and something that I never touched based on before. And my experience of visiting Japan last time with you all guys uh, it just helped a lot. And then uh, the understanding that I had from then, it just, I'm utilizing it now. Yeah. And so in the last question, the garnish. So you said it was ume as in like the ume plum. So is it the, is it the flower from the plum tree? Like, do you know what it is? Um, there, there is a, it's, it's not there. It's not there from the plum tree. It has a specific name. It's a moon ume or something. Or maybe I can send you the name later on, on, on this one. It has a specific name. But when I ask chef, it's like, just keep it as ume. And it tastes like almond. But it has a very, very specific name that I ask him also. And uh, he's like, he will get back to me. So um, once I hear it from him, um, I'll let you know. But it's, it's in like literally, Dawn, it's incredible that when you have a small, like literally one flower, it tastes like you're having a one almond in your mouth. It's impressive. Is that like just local to Hong Kong? Like, is no? Is this is from actually Japan? from Japan. This is certainly from Japan. Um, and uh, again, it was part of the R and D that the chef was doing it. And uh, when he was explaining us in one of the training, we we found it quite fascinating because that point, it's funny. We were looking at the garnish for uh, this specific drink as well. We are like, we should have a banana chip or we should have something else on top. But then when we came across this, we are like, you know, I think if something that deserves to be somewhere is this garnish on top of uh, what else this particular does the chef use that for? Like, I'm is, sorry? Does he, use it in an, does he use it in another dish? He, he, that's what he was planning to, but I don't think it made it actually. That's why it actually when he ordered it, he wanted to use for a presentation of some of the uh, dishes that he has. But then at the end, I think the flavor all didn't work out, but he brought it us to introduce us to this uh, spice, also this uh, ingredient that he had, and uh, it didn't work for him, but it certainly worked for us. Yeah, that's amazing. I now I want to go try this. Uh, it's I've never heard of it before, and I'm and I'm very curious. Um, I know you have to go, uh, so you can't join us for questions at the end. But we have one question in the audience. Um, uh, Fernet Hunter, um, not something I've ever seen in America. Can you hold up the bottle so we can see what the label looks like? I've never seen it before. So Fernet Hunter, um, this is from Austria. There's a, there's a very young kid. Uh, his name is Rafael. He's making it in, uh, in, on in Austria. He's, I think it's, his father started it. Now he's making it. This is the, the second edition of it. He has first one, which was a little bit more sweeter. This version, I absolutely love it. It's a bit more drier style of it. And it's not as, um, as bitter as the Ferne Branca or Ferne Branca Menta is. But the inspiration of this is actually from Ferne, uh, Ferne Branca. And uh, one of the ingredients that I find is quite fascinating that he uses, and this is the chamomile tea uh, as, as, uh, as one ingredient. And, and it just so beautifully works with the drinks that you want a little bit of dryness but not overly bitterness to it. And it just works. That's why if you hear, there is no additional sugar to it. And then the only sugary element that we have is the uh, banana uh, syrup, but then, oh, sorry, banana, banana liqueur, but then 
the 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 uh, the sugar is taken away and give dryness from uh, Fernay Hunter, which I think stands out really well. Well, thank you so much. And uh, please let us know what that uh, that flower is. Get some more information from your chef. And, yes. Uh, when uh, a Don, your, I will uh, recipe on uh, on the on the Instagram. Maybe we can post a picture of that of that flower too, because I got to find that now. I know how curious you are and, and, and meeting you last time in Japan is just been absolute pleasure. And I certainly will find out because even I want to know and I want to share it with my team as well so that we are well aware of when we are explaining to the guest. And uh, it, it just, just so good. It makes me feel like eating one. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for joining us today. And hopefully we'll see you soon once this uh, pandemic's over. Maybe we can all meet in Japan again. Fantastic, Don. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, please stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. See you later. All right. Moving on to San. Uh, you are on mute. If you could unmute yourself. Are you hearing me? Yes, yep, right. We can hear you. Yeah, I'm sitting in my bar counter like very, for the first time. I'm sitting in my bar counter and making drinks. So, All again, right. Yeah. So what's the cartel you have for us today? So yeah, maybe my name is San. Everybody knows it by now. But again, uh, I'm working in penicillin. This is a sustainable bar. First time in Hong Kong, we try to be sustainable. Having said that, it's more about closed loop cycle using all the ingredient to the fullest. Uh, so that's why we always keep on seeing the ingredient in our bar, at the surrounding, at the same time in like f &B industry as well. So the cocktail that I am making today is uh, came out of uh, some of the leftover things. Uh, it will be in Hong Kong, let's say. So basically right now there is Chinese New Year in Hong Kong, you guys might know. And then here in Hong Kong, like we can see a lot of uh, compote that's basically tangerine. and people uh, used to, uh, people always love to put that in their houses for decoration here and there. And after the Chinese New Year in, is gone, then it's just a kind of waste. So we came out with an idea. Why don't we use all these things in our cocktail? in our next menu. So the drink that I'm presenting today is uh, one of the cocktail that we will be using in our next menu. Yeah, so the first ingredient is kombot and I'm using uh, soju. Uh, thanks to Singo uh, to, for sending uh, this amazing spirit. Uh, the uh, soju I'm using is emo, but uh, all the uh, small ingredient that we, we, we will be using, like it's really hard to uh, present in a bar. That's why all the drinks are all this pre bad so that we can be more consistent uh, in the drink. So that's why I actually have the drinks pre bad but again, I will go through the ingredient that I use to make the cocktail. I take the emo soju and I blend it with the kombot and then yogurt, and then it goes through the clarification process, the first ingredient. And then the second ingredient is uh, salted coconut. And the third one is a uh, plankton uh, syrup actually. So these three came together with a drink and then uh, the drink itself, the name is the Ed Said that we'll be using it as a name in our next menu probably. And then the drink is pre bad and uh, we have a cheese wax bottle and we will be uh, like uh, putting it in the fridge uh, for 24 hours just to get more depth in the flavor. Uh, so yeah, uh, let me uh, make the drinks. Go with the glass. The garnish, I get a slice of uh, compot again. So this is the drink, here we go, cheers. Great. Yeah, and talking about the drinks, uh, it's a more uh, umami, a citrusy, uh, and uh, like a, a little bit sweetness from the coconut. It's a overall, like you can get all the character in the drinks. Uh, you can uh, get saltiness, umaminess, and sweetness, and citrus as well. 
So I have a bunch of questions. So kumquat yes, and tangerine. So when I think of a kumquat, it's very small, like about the size of a grape. So that's so that's what we're talking about. Like a tangerine yes. is like like maybe like a tennis ball size. So we're talking about the very small one. Yes, like you eat the uh, like, whole thing. Uh, yes, yeah. I have here like if you <laughs> this one. So the idea came up to uh, one of our like uh, friend. Uh, she delivered us a couple of kumquat, uh, which uh, like I think she is uh, doing it. Uh, uh, she's importing it in Hong Kong. So she came up with that uh, kumquat. Then uh, after getting the receiving the kumquat, and after going. Uh, with uh, this idea, we think about why uh, why not we use tangerine that is a lot of wastage in Hong Kong. Uh, why don't we go with that kind of thing? So it's a, basically this cocktail is using compote, but again, when we go with a regular menu, maybe it is not very uh, relevant for us uh, to use a, like a lot of compote importing from outside. So better, uh, we were thinking of uh, instead of compote, we will use uh, uh, whatever we get in the like surroundings, like, like just recycling and upcycling. That's our concept actually here. So yeah, that was the idea. And so with the kumquat, are you juicing it? Are you like blending it? Like what are you doing to the kumquat? No, actually uh, for the drinks, like we are just taking the zest, it's just zesting and the okay. remaining, again, the fruit will be remaining like, and that fruit we put it in our, in the fermentation because uh, we always uh, upcycle the things over here in our bar. So we, we make kumquat wine as well uh, from the leftover and we use just the zest for the drink. Okay, so you, you took the zest and you put that into the shochu to, to get the, the flavor yes. out into the shochu. And then yes. what, is the, what is the salted coconut? So it's basically just a coconut, uh, uh, so just adding a little bit of salt just to open the flavor actually. So it's, uh, as I heard earlier, you mentioning it's not about MSC, it's about just adding a little bit of salt to open all the flavors out. Uh, actually, it's just uh, regular coconut water a fresh coconut water with a bit of salt. Yeah. Okay, so it's the coconut water. You're not like, it's not a coconut pulp or fresh coconut. It's just coconut water with a little bit of salt. Yes, it is. Like fresh okay. coconut water, we get it, and then it's just salt. Yeah. Okay, and then the syrup. Did you say it was plankton syrup? Yes, it is, yeah. So where do you get plankton from? Actually, we get it as a powder uh, over here in Hong Kong. But again, if, uh, uh, if uh, the people who collect it, maybe it can be seed. But again, what we get, it was a powder actually. What color is it? It's a green color. That's why the drink is a little bit greeny because of the plankton. plankton. Oh, maybe uh, I'm forgetting the word for it. There's a, um, you can get it as like a health food in, in smoothies in the US. Maybe that's uh, what, you, what, what you're calling plankton. We know as something else. Uh, I'm, could be, could be. Uh, That's people, uh, I think it's like, not. I'm not quite sure about that, but uh, uh, they say it uh, phytoplankton, something like that. And, yeah, and they call it marine phytoplankton. Phyto yeah, phyto marine phytoplankton. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you, and then the final thing, uh, you put beeswax, you melt beeswax, you put it inside a bottle, and then you pour the batched cocktail into the bottle, and then you're, so, you're bottle aging it in in the uh, in the bot in with with beeswax is that what you're saying it's uh sorry to uh, cut you off it's not beeswax it's a cheese wax basically uh, so basically we coat the bottle with cheese wax and put the drinks in that bottle after pre bashing it and then we just put it in the fridge uh, for around one day basically around 24 hours and before like uh, the idea is before serving it the bottle is always in the fridge uh, with the cheese wax so it gives you what more uh, umami wax? flavor. It uh, came as a block, uh, same like wax actually. You can uh, buy in like markets. Uh, it's just a kind of wax and then we can melt it and we can put it in the bottle actually. Very interesting. You're using so many ingredients that I've never worked with myself. It's uh, I really want to try this too. Like it's uh, it's very interesting. Um, and then yeah, when you, yeah. what, what's, your, what's your food program at your bar like? You also try to be sustainable in the food as well as the drink? Yes, so like here, uh, the idea is more about uh, keeping the ingredient very minimal and locally sources actually. So we have a food program that also match with our cocktail program as well. So we then have very large uh, selection, but again, we try to uh, make our guests uh, happy within that uh, small uh, range actually. So whatever uh, we uh, get from the kitchen, we try to always match with the cocktail program. But having said that, it's not like all like kind of food query. It's more about uh, 
uh, connecting the drinks and the food. So it's uh, very easy to source. At the same time, there is very minimal wastage as well. Very, very interesting. Very cool. So two amazing bars in Hong Kong. Once the, uh, the pandemic's over, if any of us can make it to Hong Kong, we, we have to go try both your drinks and uh, Devander's drinks. So uh, very exciting. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to open this back up to, uh, to every uh, bartender who's with us now. And if folks that are watching, if you have questions, please uh, put them in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll try to answer your questions. Um, Joshin and uh, Shingo, do you guys have any thoughts or questions about uh, the drinks you saw today or things you wanted to bring up? Uh, give us one second. We're going to turn the camera back on. <laughs> uh, while we're waiting for uh, Joshin and Shingo, Sun, did you also get a chance to, to visit Japan and to visit uh, distilleries while you were there? Well, I haven't visited uh, any of the distilleries actually. Yeah. Till now, no. but uh, yeah, again, uh, my plan was for 2020 traveling a lot and everything happened. So, yeah, let's hope uh, for yeah, 2021 it brings so we can travel again. And is there a favorite food pairing that you have between uh, shochu and uh, and you know whether it's bar food, Japanese food? You know, do you have a, a thing that you like to eat when you're uh, you're drinking shochu? Well. Uh, for soju, soju reminds me of something that like, I, I basically I'm from Nepal and uh, we have a kind of very like house kind of distillery. We made a couple of uh, uh, house distillation, very traditional one. And it, it soju always remind me of that kind of thing, even sake. And then uh, for me, like uh, drinking soju, uh, there, uh, like as a, it's not about particular food pairing, but it can go well with everything basically. But I always love uh, having something more like uh, a spiciness a kind of thing uh, drinking with soju because soju is more uh, uh, like a kind of a neutral kind of thing and then i love to go, uh, go with the spicy things for like personal uh, uh, choice actually yeah great shingo looks like you're back with us sorry yeah we were back <laughs> no worries uh so how about you two? What are your favorite things to eat, you know, and uh, ha when you're having shochu outside of your own bar? So when you're out in the world, what, what comes to mind is your favorite pairing? Well, typical shochu pairing uh, for me is a uh, uh, pork belly and uh, shochu with hot water. Oyuari. That's my, I think it's, that's my uh, favorite and daily shochu pairing. Nice. For you, Joshin? Yeah, I would actually have to say oyuari as well. So shochu with hot water. Um, it's it's like whether I, I like the fact that you can drink something warm with dinner as it kind of keeps your palate really engaged as opposed to really chilling it down with like carbonated um, sort of highball style drinks or something like that. So even if I'm eating like something room temperature or even um, Maybe not something like a cold dessert, but a warm uh, shochu, it just kind of keeps the palate really engaged and open. I, I love that that warm, just kind of like, as soon as the hot water hits the shochu, it gives you that intense aroma. And then it's just like, this. it's almost like putting a warm blanket over yourself, right? And it's uh, it's such a comforting feeling uh, when you're having that. Um, is what, what about for a food pairing though? When you're having or you are your joshin, what do you like to eat with it? Um, to be honest, I have oyuari every day with dinner, no matter what I'm eating. So, um, but one of the actually like uh, pairings that blew my mind with like a, not a cocktail, but just like simple oyuari was uh, sweet potato, like imo shochu, sweet potato shochu oyuari with cheesecake. That was really, really good. Wow. That yeah. I would never have thought to try that. Yeah. Uh, was it like the spongy kind? Like uh, when I think of Japanese cheesecake, it's that kind of wobbly spongy kind or was it like the dense, like New York style? No, it was like a dense, yeah, like a dense kind of cream cheesy style. All right, next time I have a, a, a cheesecake, I'm gonna have to try it with some uh, some, some shochu. Yeah. Uh, so any questions from the audience? Uh, I mean, we saw so many cool things. I'm, I'm surprised that no one else has any questions. now oh yeah we're getting the extreme close-up to shingo now <laughs> all right
right. Well, I know that San has to go pretty soon too. Um, let's see. Question from, uh, oh, okay. A question from Maya. Uh, so I guess this is a question for San since you're in Hong Kong. Um, so interestingly, the, the two people who are from Hong Kong said uh, Soju as opposed to Shochu. Uh, is that a thing that's commonly confused specifically in Hong Kong? Um, is that something where just in Hong Kong, you just tend to use the same word? Uh, how does that work in Hong Kong? I think, I think like uh, as, a, as a customer, as a consumer, maybe people are a little bit confused. But that's uh, two different kind. We always uh, need to tell them even for Sochu is uh, something new for cocktail bars. Like we, we have never used it, uh, being very honest. Like we just, uh, we drink it outside of our bars, but for bars, we never use it. Uh, even for as a customer kind of view, like people are confused about soju and soju. Even while pronouncing, sometimes even we we did it like uh, we say it's soju. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, not very very common, but again uh, something that we need to educate people as well. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely a problem here in America where the average customer doesn't know the difference, uh, and yeah. so very often if they see shochu written out and they see the H. They're like, just like, what is this? Or they just, it, because for whatever reason, soju is more common, at least in most places I've been to in the States, people just assume that everything is the soju and that they don't know that it is actually from a different country and a, and a very different product. Uh, what about, I mean, obviously in Japan, everyone knows exactly what shochu is. Is this something that in your travels that you found uh, uh, Shingo and uh, Joshin, like people who are confused between the two? I mean, okay, so in Japan, there is a whole different sort of confusion, uh, which is not so much between soju and shochu, which is in Japanese, it's a pretty clear distinction, but more between honkaku shochu and like continuous distilled shochu. So that is both called shochu, but um, a lot of people don't realize that there is a pretty fundamental difference between something that is single distilled you know, with nothing except for water added after distillation and something that is a more kind of uh, continuous or industrial sort of uh, manufacturing method. So a lot of times the that variety is used like vodka in uh, izakaya drinks and stuff like more as a more neutral base. And a lot of people when they talk about shochu, especially younger people, um, that's what they're talking about. So it's actually even more confusing than the soju and shochu thing because it's the same word as right. the base. So you, you need like a little bit of an understanding to even distinguish the two. So in, you know, in America at least, uh, because like there's so little knowledge, those of us in the bar world, at least when we're making drinks, we tend to only work with uh, honkaku. So we're working with that, you know, that single distilled, like that higher quality uh, shochu. Um, I don't think I've ever even seen a like a, I guess you would call it like a korui, like a like the continuous distillation style. It's is you know in Japan, how do you differentiate the two? Do you just call one uh, like you know continuous and one uh, single, or to the average person, they they've never even they don't even know that there's a difference. Um, e like even average people, I think they know the word korui and. Um, Typically, it's like honkak shochu and kori shochu, but it really depends on who you're talking to because if uh, their standard is kori, they'll just call that shochu. And if, you know, for most honkak shochu makers, a lot of them don't even, uh, I need to be careful with my words, but a lot of them don't even consider, uh, you know, consider uh, the continuous variety as the same spirit. So it kind of right. depends on who you talk to. And so as a non-Japanese person, I'm of Korean descent born in America. So I, I see the word honkaku a lot. I've, d I've never really heard someone say, but I've read it in books. The, uh, what is it, uh, otsurui? otsurui or yeah. Also, yeah, is that a word that's also common and used just as commonly as honkaku or no? Um, so, oh, so you know, it used to be common, but I, I think uh, uh, we don't use that word anymore. Oh yeah, so San has to leave. Thank you so much for joining us, San. Uh, we'll hopefully see you soon. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, allowing this. Thank
thank you very much. I have to leave because we're about to open. And yeah, thank you again. We hope to see, uh, see everyone soon. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. Bye-bye. Sorry to cut you off, Shingo. What were you saying? Yeah, well, we used to use the word, uh, but otsuri, that means like second in, kind of second in Japanese. So that's not really positive word. So now uh, Honkaku Shochu maker wants to use Honkaku Shochu word instead of otsuri. Got it. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that like, I've only read in books. I've never actually heard anyone say that. So I've always been like, oh, it's like, it looks very similar in that, like, you know, it's blank, Louis, like, you know, I would think that this would be more common, but I've just never seen it except in, it, in its written form. Um, and then let's see, I think we've got a, uh, another question. Uh, what is it? So um, question coming from uh, Jeremy, uh, what's the most unique ingredients uh, base shochu you guys have tried? Uh, so I'm guessing, what is the most unique base ingredient that was then used to distill a shochu that you've tried? Uh, I know that it has been made from all sorts of other things. Um, I think the, the most uncommon one that I've personally tried was tomato. Um, I don't know if you guys have, I know that it's also made from like chestnuts and all sorts of other things. What other uncommon uh, ingredient shochu bases have you tried? Well, I guess like for me, dates, um, it's, uh, it's basically the, one of the only fruits that are legally, uh, you can make honkaku shochu out of, and it was actually really, really delicious, but what they were saying, the guys who made it, what they were saying is because with most shochu, they're working with, um, more like starchy ingredients as opposed to like actual like you know sugars need to be unlocked for them to be available with most shochu making whereas with dates there is sugar very readily available and the texture of the fruit is so different from like uh, potato and um, rice and stuff that their typical brewing methods just didn't work at all like things would get stuck in the factory and like you you would you know it's legally you can make honkaku shochu with these other ingredients but the actual method of doing it is going to be so different in a lot of cases that i guess it's um quite difficult for uh say like a rice distillery to start playing with a bunch of other ingredients yeah that's uh that would be very difficult do you know if it was like the like the middle eastern date where it's like very like thick on the inside or is it like the the Asian like red skin date where it's like, uh, I think in America we call them like jujubes. Uh -huh. I think you know, they were using the, the, more, the more Middle Eastern style. Yeah. So, yeah, and then you have to like take the seed out. Like, I wonder like, did they do the same thing where it's like the two different fermentations, like the first and second Moromi or, yeah, that, that must be really weird. I don't know, they made it 30 years ago and they said they never did it again. <laughs> so I, I tried it and it was really delicious. Um, and the guy was mostly just talking about how difficult it was, but I, I don't know how they did it, but he was saying that like, you know, that he had an idea of how he was going to go about it and basically nothing went as planned. So he was sort of adjusting a lot on the spot uh, and then it turned out to be really delicious. So it's kind of amazing that he did that, but yeah. It's... And how about you Shingo? Have you tried any of these more? obscure shochus? I think um, uh, the most interesting interesting one uh, that I tried was uh, smoked sweet potato shochu. So uh, Kagoshima, Makurazaki city is very famous for katsuobushi, the things that I used earlier, uh, uh, bonito flake. Uh, so Satsuma Shuzo, they tried to make the, um, uh, just a sample, we didn't actually sell. Uh, sweet potato smoke in the uh, machine where usually smoke as uh, uh, bonito flake. Then they ferment it and, you know, they basically make the uh, shochu uh, based on that uh, sweet potato. Tastes exactly uh, like mezcal and a little bit of, uh, you know, katsu, like kind of, you know, fish notes. Uh, and it was, I think one of the, it's definitely the, uh, the most interesting one that I tried. Yeah, that also sounds really interesting. Uh, you should do a, um, you know, similar to like, you know, the, the, the mezcal uh, style where, you know, you hang the, uh, the chicken breast inside the yeah, still. Yeah, yeah, pechuga, you yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, you, sh you should get just like the, before you, you flake the bonito when it's one big hunk, hang that in the still and then make your own like, you know, 
you know, your uh, bonito uh, pechuga. That's that's <laughs> cool. Yeah, pechuga shochu. Yeah. All right. Uh, one more question for you, Joshin. Um, where did you learn so much about uh, shochu, and uh, how much time have you spent with uh, these uh, shochu distillers? Uh, um, well. I guess like I'm quite lucky because I, I get to work with my favorite spirit. So it, when I was really young, like I'm half Japanese, my, my father's side of the family is from Kyushu in Fukuoka. And basically that's, shochu is all my uncle drinks. He just drinks oiwari every night. And as soon as we can walk, basically, I have a brother and four, four female cousins. But like as soon as we're like four or five years old at dinner, he'll hand one of us randomly the glass and then we have to go fill it up with hot water and we've been making oiwari since like i can remember i thought i thought oiwari was drinking when i was young i thought that that's what alcohol was so that was kind of like the introduction and then so since i started you know um working at fmb in new york and stuff at like at sakamai where we served a lot of sake and shochu um, there was more opportunity to kind of taste a wide variety and just kind of got into it from there. Cool. Who among your uh, your family then? Among like you know your uh, cousins, who made the best oi wari? You know, um, my my uncle. He his oi wari ratio has been steadily getting uh, lighter and lighter as he gets older. So the <laughs> I think it's just a matter of like every every time I come back to Japan. He'll, he'll point out the glass and say, here, I want it up to here. And when I was young, it was like halfway of the glass. And now it's like nine tenths of the way water and like <laughs> a little bit shochu. So I think it's just more like how he's feeling, you know, as opposed to who makes the best. Got it. Uh, yeah. And then we have a question from uh, Yoshie. She asks, uh, what is this? Uh, was the date shochu you talked about um, Seiju Hai, do you remember? Do you know what the name of that date shochu was? Um, so it it was actually made by Takahashi Shuzo back in the seventy or eighties, back in the eighties, and um, it was called like some something kind of like special edition or something of sorts. It didn't have a specific name. Got it. All right. So if there aren't any other questions, then uh, I mean. Thanks for sticking around to the to the end. Uh, we, unfortunately, we lost the two uh, guys from Hong Kong, but uh, this has been a, a, an amazing opportunity for us to to try or to to see the drinks that you guys are serving at a SG Club that sadly most of us won't get to try. One other person commented earlier; it wasn't a question, but uh, they wanted you to continue serving uh, these flights because they wanted to to make it to to Tokyo to try it. But uh, sadly, uh, it looks like. You, uh, we won't, most of us won't have that opportunity. Um, for those of you that joined us today, thank you for coming to learn about Shochu and to, to see what amazing bartenders are, are making with them all around the world. If you have any further questions, once this is posted on the internet, please add, uh, you know, uh, post your questions there. Someone will try to get back to you. And uh, as I said earlier, please don't be afraid of uh, food pairings and think that it's a, a special thing that has to be done correctly it just works, go out there and try it with food. And uh, for those of you who, when you, if you had the, the chance to try shochu straight and maybe you're like, I don't really get this yet, definitely try it with food. Go out to an izakaya, go out to a Japanese restaurant, have it with food and you'll, you'll see just how versatile the spirit is and just how amazing and fun it is to have it with food. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you, hey, thank you, Don. Thank you.